And thank you as well for uh, supporting WOLA's work in pursuit of public policies that support human rights, democracy, social justice, by working with the kinds of colleagues from Latin America like those we're honoring here tonight. Um, before we start, I want to uh, recognize a few distinguished guests from the Diplomatic Corps. We have uh, Ambassador Milton Romani, the new Uruguayan ambassador to the OAS. Prior to this posting, Milton was our favorite drug czar in Latin America. Uh, ambassador Francisco Alchu. We have two Salvadoran ambassadors. Francisco. And and uh, Verna, Ambassador Verna Romero, uh, the Salvadoran ambassador to the UK, is with us this evening as well. Verna? And while I haven't seen her this evening, I am told that from the administration, uh, Under Secretary of State for Civilian Security, Democracy, and Human Rights, Maria Otero, is with us this evening. And this one. Uh, Mark Fierstein, the Assistant Administrator for Latin America, for uh, uh, no, excuse me here. Um, yes. Prior to that, Roberta Jacobson, the Assistant Secretary of State for Western Hemisphere Affairs, is with us. Yes. And from the Latin America program at, uh, at USAID, we have both Mark Fierstein and I see Mark Lopez right there. Nice to, <laughs> nice to see you. And then there's one other dignitary I want to recognize tonight, which is my mother from Wisconsin. <laughs> Um, the theme of tonight's gala is overcoming violence, citizen security, and the new human rights agenda. Uh, th this has been a theme a long time in the making at WOLA. <clears throat> the theme is meant to challenge ourselves and others. Uh, and it's a theme that's born of years of frustration and feeling that the traditional definition of human rights uh, was not adequately responding to the realities that we were all confronting. Uh, a case in point for me is uh, last week. Uh, last week, WOLA hosted uh, Javier Cecilia and members of the peace movement from Mexico. This movement is made up of families of victims of drug-related violence. And as I uh, walked through the group and had a number of discussions, talking with, uh, uh, talking with some of the victims of, of violence who were there, um, what, what I found was uh, I met a series of... Uh, of people who told me um, shocking and amazing stories. One of them was a woman who had lost four sons. Uh, another was a young man who had lost both his mother and two sisters. Uh, another was a father of an engineer, a young man uh, who had been lost as well. And I was, I was shocked by the number of people who were a part of the, the, this movement who were not, um, whose loved ones weren't dead, they were missing. And the numbers became very real. While the estimates are debated, uh, the numbers were around 60,000 dead and 10,000 disappeared in the last six years in Mexico alone. But those numbers and those, the levels of those numbers are reminiscent of the dirty war years in the southern cone. But there's one very big dis difference from the past. The great majority of these deaths and disappearances are, are not likely to have been committed by the state or state actors, but by criminals. And therefore, these families are not really considered victims of human rights violations. And while I realize that I've now touched a nerve with all the lawyers in the room, <clears throat> um, I think that's okay. Uh, the debate about how citizen security fits the human rights agenda is one that we all need to have. Uh, and uh, one thing that's clear to us is that from the favelas in Rio, to the comunas in Medellin, to the streets of San Salvador, for the victims of violence, citizen security is a human rights issue. 
And it's a human rights issue because governments have to be held accountable for governing, for prosecuting criminals, and for keeping the peace. How it fits the international legal framework will take decades to figure out. But tonight we're here to honor a few of our courageous colleagues who have dedicated their lives to standing up for uh, victims of crime and violence and standing um, against crime and violence. Uh, they do this from very different angles because citizen security is a very complicated problem. They do it by working to prevent youth violence, by investigating corruption, uh, and organize criminal networks, and by actively working on police reform. I'm reminded of a lesson that my mother taught me, uh, <clears throat> which was, you'll be known by the company you keep. And uh, so we are all very glad tonight to keep company with Tran Transito Ruano from Pasos, with Carlos Dada from El Faro, and with Helen Mack. And now it's my privilege to introduce to you Dr. Gabriela Lemus, a Senior Advisor to Secretary of Labor, Hilda Solis. Gabby has a long and illustrious bio. She's been uh, a leader in the Latino and labor communities, a champion of immigration reform and migrant rights, and a crusader against human trafficking. If I read you the complete list of her accomplishments, it'll be longer than the talk she's supposed to give. Uh, so, um, <clears throat> perhaps the most important thing that I can tell you about Gabby is that she's one of us. She's a longtime collaborator with WOLA. She served on our board until she was snatched up by Secretary Solis, uh, where she is now the director of the Office of Public Engagement. I know from personal experience that her skills at coalition building and community outreach serve her well as the Secretary's liaison to key constituencies throughout the country. We were delighted when uh, the secretary brought Gabi into this key position on her leadership team, and we are delighted that she is with us tonight. Um, so I introduce to you Gabriela Lemos. Um, someone rewrote my bio, but thank you. <laughs> um, Okay, and I am going blind. My apologies. So, um, thank you, Joy. Um, like I said, you're very well loved. And um, I always love being with you, and I always love being with Wola. Um, you're part of my family. And I'm ever so humbled. I feel like I've been allowed to surrogate for the secretary. Um, it's always um, humbling to do that because she's such a rock star. But I'll do my best to hold up my end. So, um, I'd like to... I'm, you know, I wanted to highlight a whole bunch of things that we're doing at the Department of Labor, but I think perhaps, um, you know, especially given the Secretary's vision, which I think she shares with Wola, and, um, you know, I think um, uh, you really have to think about how Secretary Solis and Joy came together, and um, when she was a congresswoman, she worked closely with Wola, and, and Joy um, took her to Ciudad Juarez. And this is a story she shares with me all the time. You can tell I, I've totally thrown my notes out the window. Sorry, guys. Um, but um, she, she shares with me all the time about how much she enjoyed working with all of you, and, and particularly with Joy and that very difficult trip, and how much it marked her, and continues to mark her today. And you can see it in much of the work that we are doing at the Department of Labor and the leadership that she provides, because she really does care about what happens, what happens to workers, what happens to women, what happens to migrants, what happens to refugees, what happens before they get here, if they get, you know, if they're on their way here. Um, she cares about all these issues in a very profound way, and she directs us all to really think about how we can do a better job, how we can rethink in a world of very uh, increasingly limited resources, how can we rethink the use of those resources to really address the challenges that are facing um, our world today uh, in terms of economics, but also the, the, the social conditions that we are facing and, and the work that you do here at WOLA, which is really the, the heart and soul of so many things, it's human rights. 
Um, I always say that, and she says, you know, labor rights are human rights, and um, it really guides what we do. Um, you know, uh, I think um, I, I do want to share a few points with you about what we are doing that's unusual and a little different. Um, the secretary di uh, directed us, uh, myself in particular, to really begin looking at the transnational aspects of migration um, in the sense of how do we work with migrants here, how do we think about them before they arrive, whether they are guest workers coming in on a visa, uh, a farm worker, or an H-1B, a high tech, uh, so that they understand what they are, um, what their rights are before they arrive to the United States, et cetera. And, um, Additionally, um, some of the work that I have been engaged in to uh, really look at the issue of human trafficking and approach it in a more holistic way within the department. And those two points alone, I think, are, are worth highlighting because at, we have engaged in something called joint declarations with nine countries at this point, um, all from South and Central and South America. But, um, well, I'm sorry, Central America, actually, some South America. Uh, but also the Philippines. And these are high areas of migration. And because of the human rights work you do, these are peoples who are escaping a variety of conditions or choosing to leave if, if they come in as guest workers. It's, it's a whole number of things. And it's really interesting because it creates an infrastructure by which we can use our domestic policy and apply it to these, um, with, I shouldn't say to them, but with the embassies and the consulates to really begin to have a formal way of dialoguing. And it influences how we are able to then talk to them about labor rights in their own country through our International Labor Affairs Bureau. So it's a very dynamic process. It's very beautiful. Um, and it, it's bearing fruit. It's only a year old. And uh, we're seeing it, it's sort of taking on a life of its own. Uh, the other component, which I mentioned, was human trafficking, and this is raising its ugly head more and more. And the Department of Labor, really, our role is not to uh, in, do the criminal investigations. That's Department of Justice and, and Department of Homeland Security. However, our role really is to inhibit the conditions by which human trafficking take place. And that is really a critical issue because we investigate workplaces, we we go into farm worker areas where very vulnerable communities exist, and we discover many things. And increasingly, we're seeing that uh, human trafficking isn't just sex trafficking. It really is. It, there's also a whole area of labor trafficking, and it's rapidly expanding. And I know we're, uh, the work that WOLA does with, with organized crime and drug trafficking throughout the Americas, this, this, um, we're seeing increasing linkages. And so, um, you know, that's not our part. But um, we, we are doing our best to really engage on that. And this is all because Secretary Solis, in so many ways, worked with Joy way back when. And it really opened her mind, a mind that was already engaged because she is the child of immigrant parents. She's the first Latina cabinet secretary in history. I joke with her, we are both pan-Latina. She's um, half Nicaraguan, half Mexican. I'm half Mexican, half Italian, but I grew up in Puerto Rico. I lived in Chile. So you know how it goes. So <laughs> and, um, and, and it really is, um, it really is wonderful working for her and, and to share this evening with you. And on her behalf, I thank you. I, I, I also, kudos to the folks you are nominating, you've nominated for these awards. And, um, and you're awarding tonight, the work that they've done is amazing. And um, I hope they realize how special this award is because this is a very special organization. So thank you all. Thank you so much, Dr. Lemos. <clears throat> um, so my, my role tonight is, is master of ceremonies, and, and for those of you who were here last, last year, uh, Joe Eldridge was, was master of ceremonies, and he was uh, so graceful and so articulate and so funny. Um, uh, I uh, can be neither graceful nor articulate, uh, uh, nor funny. Uh, 
but I will try to, I will try to be brief. Um, so uh, that, that said, uh, I have important things to, to say about uh, important people. And um, one of my jobs as Master of Ceremony is like the worst protocol job in Washington. It's to, to introduce the introducer. Uh, it's, usually, uh, it's usually a miserable task that you sort of suck it up and you take it. But, uh, but uh, tonight it's a rare treat because I have some really wonderful people to introduce. Um, uh, people who have important things to say and who are, uh, who are heroes in their own right. Um, the first one um, I'm going to introduce is, uh, is Candace Cater. Um, I'm, I'm going to read this part because, uh, uh, well, well, whereas Joe knows everybody, um, I don't. So, um, so like, a, like a, a good stooge, I, I have a, a good script and, um, and I'm, I'm going to uh, try to, to read from it and read from it quickly. Um, but, uh, but Candace, as I, as I read her bio, it was, uh, it was really quite remarkable. She's done amazing things. Uh, she's a prominent uh, Washington-based lawyer um, uh, working with Latino youth. Uh, she co-founded uh, Maggio and Cater, uh, which is well known within the community for its best-in-class political asylum and immigration work. Uh, through her legal work, Candace gained a unique insight into the experiences and challenges facing Central American immigrants in the United States. In 1998, uh, she founded a, a nonprofit organization called Identity, which works to empower Latino youth uh, who face problems ranging from cultural adjustment to gang violence. Candace has been a powerful advocate for Central American youth, both in Washington and in their home countries, working to develop positive alternatives and helping them realize their potential. Like our honoree, PASOS, Identity is a model program that has had important successes in working with youth to stop violence before it starts. In fact, WOLA featured Identity's violence prevention work in a best practices publication some years ago. And for the past several years, WOLA staff have relied upon the firsthand experience of Candace and her colleagues at Identity uh, for their own research on youth violence in the region. They are a valuable partner for WOLA, and as such, we can't think of anybody more qualified or appropriate uh, to present this award to PASO. So it's my great pleasure to welcome Candace Cater uh, to present the first award. Thank you very much. It's an honor to present WOLA's 2012 Human Rights Award to PASO's Education and Training Center. Many of us here tonight work in the area of youth development or are connected in some ways with violence prevention programs. We implement, fund, or support programs that engage young people in activities that keep them safe, allow them to dream, and that provide them with some of the tools they need to achieve those dreams. Many of us, however, in that work that we do, are often frustrated with the challenges that we face in our work. We are sometimes challenged by police departments that we feel engage in racial profiling of the young boys of color that we work with. We are sometimes challenged by police, by school systems that we believe try too quickly to push the most vulnerable young people out the door rather than keep them inside and give them the tools and the supports that they need. And we are sometimes challenged by the communities in which our children live. Not enough public transportation, not enough parks, not enough public spaces, and neighborhoods where violence and drug abuse are widespread. Yet we go on and try our best in the face of all of these challenges. But can you imagine, can you imagine day after day motivating young people to come to participate in your programs when they cannot board a public bus, 
without fear of extortion or robbery or worse. Can you imagine offering violence prevention programs in a place described by the State Department as one of the most violent in the world, where it is common for street crimes to be committed with AK-47s and M-16 assault rifles because they are so easily obtained there? Can you imagine trying to instill hope for a better future free of violence among children where the first thing they see in the door to the businesses in their communities are not ads for items that are on sale, but rather a private security guard armed with an automatic weapon to protect that establishment. Can you imagine trying to educate a generation of young people about valuing democracy and the role of civil society when circumstances in the country result in the lines between civilian and military rule becoming blurred? And can you imagine trying to build a sense of self-worth among the poorest and most marginalized young people while they live under the repression of government mano dura policies, strong hand policies, rather than under government policies that offer a helping hand? What we can barely imagine is the environment in which the staff of PASOS Education and Training Center has been working in for the past 15 years, implementing youth programs and training other community activists in order to serve young people from the poorest neighborhoods with some of the highest levels of violence. This evening, we all join Rola in honoring Transito Ruano and her staff at PASOS for their courage and perseverance in confronting the violence in El Salvador. We honor Pasos for instilling hope in a place that many see hopelessness. And we honor them for exemplifying Wola's own commitment to a human rights agenda where citizen security is a basic human right. Thank you. Buenas noches. Agradezco a la oficina en Washington para Asuntos Latinoamericanos, WOLA, por esta distinción y a ustedes que nos honran con su presencia por permitirme unas palabras. Good evening. I would like to thank the Washington Office on Latin America, WOLA, as well as all of you who honor me with your presence for this distinction and for allowing me to say a few words. Desde que recibí la invitación de WOLA para recibir el Premio en Derechos Humanos 2012, he tratado de dimensionar la gran responsabilidad y compromiso que implica aceptar este reconocimiento por su título, Superando la Violencia, la Nueva Agenda de Derechos Humanos, pero también por la trayectoria de WOLA, que es una organización que ha trabajado por el respeto de los derechos humanos, la democracia y la justicia social, y que ha apoyado procesos de incidencia política en Washington, América Latina, y especialmente en Centroamérica, en el tema de la violencia que afecta a la juventud, lo que nos ha permitido encontrarnos y coincidir. 
Since I accepted the invitation from Ola to receive the 2012 Human Rights Award, I have tried to gauge the great responsibility and commitment that this award implies, both because of the theme of tonight's ceremony, overcoming violence, the new agenda for human rights, and Wola's history. Wola is an organization that has worked for the promotion of human rights, democracy, and social justice, and has supported advocacy campaigns in Washington and Latin America. They have especially influenced Central America on the issue of youth violence, which is the issue that brought us together. Lo acepto a nombre del Centro de Formación y Capacitación para los procesos de atención a situaciones de sufrimiento social, PASOS, reconociendo la labor del equipo de trabajo que durante muchos años acompañaron este proceso. Especial mención merecen los equipos de las parroquias, vicarías, comunidades, colectivos juveniles, redes profesionales y la cooperación, especialmente Caritas Alemana, que ha contribuido para el fortalecimiento institucional y de red. También lo recibo en honor a los niños, niñas y jóvenes víctimas de la violencia social, quienes siendo víctimas y victimarios, se convirtieron en la razón de ser de los procesos formativos y de las acciones de prevención y reducción del daño que hemos implementado. I accept this award on behalf of the Education and Training Center for Processes of Care for Social Suffering Situations, PASOS, recognizing the hard work of our team who for many years has accompanied this process. Special mention also goes to the parish teams, communities, youth collectives, networks, professionals, and the donor community, especially Caritas Germany, who have contributed to strengthening our institutions and networks. I also receive this award in honor of the children and youth who are victims of social violence, who, as both victims and perpetrators of violence, are the reason behind our training programs and violence prevention activities. La violencia social y la delincuencia que afecta a la juventud en Centroamérica se abordó en los países sin considerar las causas estructurales del fenómeno, la pobreza, la falta de oportunidades de educación y salud, la violencia y desintegración familiar, las drogas, el hacinamiento, la migración, las, la posguerra, entre otras convirtiéndolo en un hecho multicausal y se abordó desde los efectos, desde un planteamiento lineal y privilegiando programas y proyectos de manodurismo que poco o nada contribuyeron a su disminución, sino por el contrario, hicieron que se desbordara y se ligara a otras expresiones de, crimin de la criminalidad. En la región se abusó de la comunicación amarillista para hacer de los jóvenes involucrados en pandillas los chivos expiatorios de la sociedad. Se optó por excluirles del sistema de educación formal y se les ha confinado a situaciones que muy poco contribuyen a su sana reincorporación familiar y social. Central American countries have addressed the problem of social violence and crime that affect the region's youth without taking into account the structural causes of the phenomenon. Poverty, lack of access to health or opportunities in education, family disintegration and violence, drugs, prison overcrowding, migration, and unaddressed post-war problems, among others. In other words, the current situation has multiple causes, yet only the side effects were addressed using a singular approach that favored iron fist policies that contributed little or nothing to the reduction of crime and violence. On the contrary, they led to an overflow into other forms of criminal activities. In the region, the abuse of sensationalist journalism made young people involved in gangs the scapegoats of society. They have been excluded from the formal education system and confined to living situations that contributed very little to a healthy participation within their families and societies in general. Las organizaciones de la sociedad civil propusimos otros caminos, otros modelos, otras dinámicas para el abordaje de la violencia y de la delincuencia. Propusimos otra agenda 
que tuviera la base reconocer la complejidad del fenómeno. Esta se fue desarrollando con recursos limitados, pero con mejores resultados cualitativos, con una perspectiva de participación juvenil y comunitaria, e hicieron suyo el reto de incidir para generar propuestas alternativas con enfoque de derechos, tomando en cuenta la prevención y la justicia restaurativa. As civil society organizations, we proposed a different way, different models, different dynamics for addressing crime and violence. We put forth a different agenda that recognizes the complexity of the issue. This strategy was developed with limited resources, but it achieved better qualitative results with its focus on youth and community participation. And we also took up the challenge of advocating for alternative proposals that focus on human rights, violence prevention, and restorative justice. Por estas experiencias de las que hemos sido partícipes, insto a las organizaciones de la sociedad civil, a la cooperación y a los países amigos de Centroamérica, especialmente al gobierno de los Estados Unidos, a considerar y apoyar las propuestas innovadoras que permitan la construcción de una nueva agenda que tome en cuenta la prevención de la violencia y la reducción del daño, la rehabilitación de las habilidades para la convivencia armoniosa, la reinserción laboral y la construcción de espacios amigables para las personas privadas de libertad. Based on our experiences, I encourage civil society organizations, the international community, donor countries, and especially the United States to consider and support the innovative proposals that allow for the construction of this new agenda, an agenda that includes a focus on violence prevention and harm reduction, processes of training and rehabilitation for a more peaceful society, and reinsertion programs. Esto supone fortalecer la institucionalidad de los estados con recursos técnicamente capacitados para que desarrollen un trabajo social con carácter científico, reconocer la necesidad de reconstruir el tejido social debilitado, posibilitando procesos en los que la participación ciudadana y comunitaria sean prioritarias construir redes en donde las instituciones de gobierno pongan su mejor esfuerzo por fortalecer la institucionalidad, sobre todo en la aplicación de la justicia y en lo que respecta a la educación formal de calidad. La empresa privada haga una mayor inversión social. Las iglesias sigan promoviendo la convivencia pacífica, los medios de comunicación informen la realidad con transparencia y ética. La sociedad civil organizada juega un rol protagónico de observación crítica y participación social. Propuestas en las que los niños, niñas, adolescentes y jóvenes en zonas de alto riesgo tengan la oportunidad de ser incluidos en las alternativas de solución. This implies strengthening state institutions by developing the technical skills of their staff so that they are better equipped to provide social services. It also means a recognition of the need to reconstruct the weakened social fabric, enabling processes in which citizen and community participation are priorities. Likewise, it implies building networks in which government institutions actively participate, especially when it comes to the judicial system and the formal education in which private enterprises have greater social investment, where churches continue promoting peaceful coexistence, and the media reports reality with transparency and ethics. Similarly, building networks where organized civil society acts as a protagonist in critical observation and social participation, and where they create projects in which children and youth in high-risk areas have the opportunity to be included in alternative solutions. He tenido presente a las organizaciones que forman la Coalición Centroamericana para la Prevención de la Violencia Juvenil, cuyos nodos locales se han convertido en referentes para las propuestas de políticas públicas con enfoque de derechos humanos. 
a la red centroamericana de organizaciones que intervienen en situaciones de sufrimiento social y a la red americana para la intervención en situaciones de sufrimiento social por el esfuerzo de desarrollar el modelo de la epistemología de la complejidad y ética comunitaria promovido por CAFAC como centro de formación para la atención de las farmacodependencias y situaciones críticas asoci asociadas en México, con el apoyo de Caritas Alemana, del que hemos sido partícipes. A Monseñor Gregorio Rosa Chávez, al Padre Pedro O'Neill de Grato Recuerdo, a las Hermanas de la Providencia y asociados y amigos de la Providencia, por sus propuestas, acompañamiento y solidaridad. En un, es un honor compartir este espacio con Helen Mack por su histórico aporte en pro de los derechos humanos en Guatemala y con Carlos Dada por su esfuerzo de generar un periodismo investigativo. Agradezco a la Providencia la comprensión de mi familia y amigos, el esfuerzo, dedicación de mi amado esposo por ser parte de esta historia y a Monseñor Romero y Emilia Gamelin, fuentes de inspiración y fortaleza. Gracias a ustedes por escucharme y creer que otra agenda y otro mundo es posible. Finally, I would like to recognize the organizations that form the Central American Coalition for the Prevention of Youth Violence whose local branches have become benchmarks for public policy proposals that focus on human rights. The Central American Network of Organizations who take part in situations of social suffering, RICOIS, and the American Network of Intervention and Social Suffering Situations, RAIS, for their effort in developing the model of the epistemology of complexity and community ethics promoted by CAFAC in Mexico, with whom we have collaborated. I would like to give recognition to Monsignor Gregorio Rosa Chavez, Father Pedro O'Neill, the Sisters of Providence, Associates, and the Friends of Providence for their proposals, accompaniment, and solidarity. It is an honor to share this opportunity with Helen Mack for, his, for her historic contribution in support of human rights in Guatemala, and it is a privilege to be here with Carlos Dada for his effort in, promotive, in promoting investigative reporting. I want to thank Providence, my family and friends for their understanding and support, and my beloved husband for his dedication and effort and for being part of this story. I also want to thank Monsignor Romero and Emilia Gamelin for being sources of inspiration and strength. Thank you all for listening and for believing that another path and another world is possible. Once again, let me thank and congratulate uh, Transito and Pasos for their terrific work. This is the easy part. I don't need a script. I invite you all to sit back, uh, relax, eat, and the, uh, uh, the presentations will continue after dinner. Thank you very much. Okay, everybody, we're gonna, we're gonna press on. Um, we have uh, a few more uh, people to listen to tonight, but they're all extraordinarily interesting with the exception of myself. Um, so if I could ask you to take your seats and um, listen up because I have some important things to say about some important people. Thank you. Um, before I begin, uh, I would just like to ask, um, I've just told you all to sit down and now I'm going to contradict myself because I'm going to ask a handful of you, my uh, fellow board members, to please stand up. 
Board members of, uh, of WOLA, please, please stand. Okay. My, board, my fellow board members, are, are, they are largely responsible for, uh, for making tonight happen. Um, they have been in touch with many of you. And, um, and uh, I am very grateful to have all of them as colleagues. Um, but who deserves even more applause, uh, before I move on to the next speaker, now I'm going off script and Christina's looking at me like I shouldn't be doing this, but uh, the staff of WOLA has really put their back into this one. So I'd like to thank the staff. Joy and her colleagues, um, it, we all know the consistently excellent work that they do, but, uh, but they have outdone themselves tonight, so thank you very much to the staff of WOLA. Um, okay, so I, uh, I'm here to introduce uh, another introducer, but uh, as with Candace, uh, I think you're going to find this one to be a real treat. I don't know Dana Priest uh, personally, but I, I feel like I do, um, because I've read pretty much everything she's, uh, she's ever published. Um, Dana is uh, one of the most, the leading, uh, the, the nation's leading journalists. She's one of the most distinguished journalists. Um, in an age where uh, distinguished journalism is, is, a, is a troubled industry, uh, Dana is distinguishing herself over and over again, as recently as this week, uh, where she published an a, a investigative report in the Washington Post on the nation's nuclear arsenal. Um, Dana has a storied career at the Washington Post. It, it, um, it, it, she's covered military um, actions from Panama to Kosovo to Afghanistan. Uh, she's written extensively on the nation's uh, covert and overt counterterrorism operations, both at home and abroad. Uh, she's been awarded the Pulitzer Prize twice. Once. Once for exposing the CIA's secret prisons overseas, and again for reporting on the scandalous lack of medical attention to our nation's soldiers at Walter Reed Army Medical Center. <laughs> then as the author of two critically acclaimed books on national security and the security state, The Mission in 2003, and just last year she published again Top Secret America, both of these titles, and frankly, Every single word that Dana writes um, are on WOLA's list of must-reads. Um, they're on the list of must-reads for anybody seeking a deeper understanding of U.S. intelligence and military policies at home and abroad. It is a great honor to have her with us tonight, and it is my great pleasure uh, to introduce her to present the next award. Dana. Thank you so much. I'm very honored to be here. And before I talk about Carlos, I have to say one thing about Joy, because when Joy called me up to ask me to do this, well, when Joy, whenever she calls me up, I get a little bit nervous, because I think back on the first time that I met Joy, and she was uh, doing the same work that I was doing. We were both chasing Southcom, and all that we both noticed that the military had increased a lot of its work uh, in South and Central America, and so, you know, when you say Joy Olson, I know all of you get a warm and fuzzy feel, but I think of her nipping at my heels. <laughs> so, uh, but it's very humbling to be here with Carlos Dada, who I'm, who we're here to celebrate, um, and is the co-founder of El Faro, um, which is, if you haven't read it, a very courageous multimedia product, uh, publication that, in his words, treats its public like intelligent people. Right. <laughs> Not always easy in the United States and almost impossible in El Salvador. Um, here, if the government doesn't like what you've written, it can try to freeze you out, might even call on its surrogates to mark you as a traitor, or it tries to intimidate your sources. 
with the threat of job loss or even prosecution, but in El Salvador, the stakes are so much higher. Writing the truth about government corruption and drug violence is often followed by death threats and, <clears throat> and far too often with murder. Some 45 journalists in Mexico alone have been killed um, since the late 90s and another dozen in Central America. And some media outlets like El Manana on the border have declared that they're no longer going to write about crime and drug violence. But El Fara has been fearless in the face of all this. Uh, it began with an idea but no money and barely actually any journalists. It had a, a bunch of students who uh, wanted to be journalists and for three years they worked and didn't even get paid. Um, their goal was to bring quality journalism to a country that could finally support it and um, to a certain extent. Uh, and they didn't just cover the news, but they tried to analyze it, and they did it all online in a country where not everyone is online. Uh, in, in about 2003, thanks to some international uh, agencies that recognized the importance of a free press in, in countries like El Salvador, started giving them some money, and for the first time they hired uh, three reporters and a photographer. Uh, and now their newsroom has expanded, Carlos just told me, to, to about 30 people. And they're producing materials um, in all different, on all different platforms, including photography and radio, and their videos are amazing, and text and books and DVDs and, uh, and conferences even. Um, so now they not only have a mission, but you seem to have a business plan, which is better than <laughs> a lot of us here in the United States. <laughs> uh, last year, El Fara inaugurated Sala Negra, a, a section that is dedicated exclusively to the coverage of violence and organized crime. And I can't imagine, you know, the Washington Post or any other newspaper doing that on such a grim, relentlessly grim uh, subject. And under Carlos's leadership, they've documented the evolution of El Salvador and the region from the political crises and the military conflicts of, of the 80s to um, the violence and drug crises of this decade. Um, covering drug cartels and organized crime is about the most dangerous thing a journalist can do. And, um, and especially as, as Carlos's publication has begun to document, when there's mounting evidence of participation in this by law enforcement officers. But they have continued to be fearless and they demand accountability from state institutions and they investigate corruption and the abuse of power. And in this way, they carry on the proudest tradition of journalism, which is to give voice to the voiceless. So in a society still struggling to strengthen its basic democratic institutions, El, El Faro plays a pivotal role in helping, in Carlos's words, to strengthen a middle class and its values, and to open uh, spaces, a space for public debate so its citizens can make better choices about their destiny. So please uh, join me in thanking Carlos Dada. <laughs> wow, that was then a priest talking about me and El Faro. <laughs> Before I say something, uh, what I was planning to say, so this is not part of my three minutes, Christine. Uh, I must tell you something, Dana. Uh, well, first, thank you very much for your kind words. Uh, 
journalistic tradition in El Salvador is made up of accidents, of broken generations. When a process is broken, then another generation comes. So we don't have reference. We have not had uh, teachers. Uh, so we've learned our task inspired by brave American and European journalists that risked and in some cases lost their lives trying to tell our story. Uh, we remember, always remember this every time uh, we think about what we do and we say so many people from outside risk their lives for, to tell our stories that it's our moral duty to keep doing that. So thank you for your kind words. Uh, <laughs> Like it's, uh, it's obvious, me and Thais, we don't get along that well. Uh, <laughs> I was actually planning to come here wearing a t-shirt. Uh, <laughs> but then Sergio Arauz, a reporter from El Faro, told me, hey, you are not Gael Garcia Bernal. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so yeah, I'm wearing a tie. <laughs> I'm very excited to be here tonight on behalf of El Faro receiving the Walla Human Rights Award. As you know, some of you know, El Faro was founded almost 15 years ago by Jorge Simán, who couldn't be here tonight with us, by Jorge and me. We are both sons of exiles that live abroad for most of the 80s, and both our fathers reacted with at least as much excitement as us when they knew about this award. My father immediately remembered that in the 70s, when he was teaching at UCA, the Jesuits University, they worked in coordination with WOLA on some reports about human rights violations from El Salvador's army and police forces. Jorge's father actually pointed out how WOLA broke the Cold War friend or foe politics to denounce in this city violations of human rights committed by the US government allies in Central America since the 70s and all the way through the 80s. Uh, Wola kept strongly denouncing repression, disappearances, and human rights abuses. This is much easier to say than to put on the just dimension. Denouncing human rights abuses saves lives. We will never know how many, and that's why it is so hard to dimension its importance. But have no doubt, denouncing human rights abuses saves lives. Uh, thank you. I was struck some years ago when I opened the Argentinian report on the disappearance of people. And I read there that political prisoners were punished for sharing their scarce food with weaker or ill prisoners. Solidarity, says the report, was forbidden. The Argentinian military perhaps knew too well how important solidarity is to build social tissue, to express the most humane gestures. Solidarity is indispensable for a society to grow more equal, fairer, and happier. Solidarity is indispensable for a society to be a real and decent society. That is a principle for our work at El Faro, and perhaps is the one that brought us here tonight. We believe in solidarity and as defending the right of the powerless to have a decent life and fully entitled to be subjects of that groundbreaking UN chart that established that all individuals, and not only the states, have some universal rights. Have some universal rights. As WOLA and other organizations around the world, we believe in solidarity as a depository of hope for better societies with happier human beings living decent lives. El Salvador made the headlines in the 80s when our societies were subject to brutal political violence that only ended with the peace agreement signed in 1992 
between the government, the army, and the guerrilla forces. The war ended, and many things changed in our country, including the nature of violence, which quickly turned into criminal and social violence. But even though we were officially in peace, we remained one of the world's most violent societies. So what didn't change was the victimization of Salvadoran society, the mounting number of victims, victims of violence and impunity. The systematic violations of human rights committed during the war remain unpunished, and current levels of impunity are as high as during those years. The sources for violence through the years also have something in common. They all have strong links to this country, to the United States. Whether it was the support for authoritarian and repressive regimes during the Cold War years, or the massive deportation of gang members after the peace agreements, or the new and imminent threat, cartels moving drugs through Central America to the United States, rapidly penetrating our weak institutions. As journalists, we have a moral obligation to tell this story. But in order to do that, we need first to understand the complexities of organized crime, how it is eroding institutionality, and how it is producing new victims. We need to tell their stories, and we are committed to keep trying to do that. We are able to do that with the support of organizations that share our values, mainly the Open Society Foundations, and of course, uh, El Faro is especially grateful with Walla for the fact that you announced this award before you had planned. And you did it so it could be known precisely when we were receiving threats. All the Walla people, I want to tell you, we will not forget your solidarity. Thank you very much. So tonight, on behalf of El Faro, I want to thank you for this great honor and dedicate the prestigious WOLA Human Rights Award to all our colleagues from Mexico, Honduras, and Guatemala that are trying to tell their stories, the stories of their own communities in dangerous environments, under threats, and risking their lives. To them, we would like to say tonight, you are not alone. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Carlos, for those uh, incredibly eloquent, moving words. Um, uh, I know what everybody out there is thinking now that, oh, God, here comes protocol guy again. Um, and, and I, to borrow Carlos's line, I'm no Garcia uh, Bernal either. Um, uh, so uh, I'm going to try to um, move right along. But the good thing about being me tonight is that Every time up, I'm up here, you guys know that somebody more interesting is coming up next. And uh, in, in this case, somebody very interesting is coming up next. Um, a a um, very special and very close friend of Wola's. George Vickers uh, will provide, present our final award this evening. George uh, currently oversees the country and regional operations for the Open Society Foundations, where he's helping to fund some of the most important human rights and democracy work done throughout the world today. The Open Society Foundations has been, and continues to be, one of Ola's most important supporters. I want to thank OSF and recognize the steadfast support tonight, which makes, it, which makes so much of this work possible.
We are thrilled to have George and many of his colleagues with us tonight. And George is uh, well known to a great many people in this room. He's been an advocate and an activist for social justice since the civil rights and anti-war movements of the 60s and 70s. He went on uh, to a doctorate in sociology and served for years as a superstar faculty member at the Graduate Center in Brooklyn College of the City University of New York, where he wrote extensively on Latin America and foreign policy. Yet he astonished his colleagues and delighted the human rights community when he left academia behind and he became WOLA's executive director. He served as WOLA's captain for eight years, during which time WOLA grew and flourished. In fact, George helped launch the very citizen security work that we celebrate here tonight. I've heard George described many ways. He's one of those guys, he's a brilliant academic, he's the smartest guy in the room, the one uh, voted most likely to succeed, the guy you're glad to have on your team. The good news is, is that Wola has had him as the team captain um, and player coach for eight years. And now Wola has him as an advisor and, a, and as a friend at the Open Society Foundations. But the entire human rights community has had him on their team for decades. We are honored to have you here tonight, George, and to present the WOLA's 2012 Human Rights Award to our dear friend, Helen Mack. So please join me in welcoming George to the podium. Well, well, it's hard to know what to say, I, uh, except that when I, I remember that my high school yearbook actually said pr the prediction was I was going to be a, a James Joyce scholar. So, uh, <laughs> ch shows how accurate uh, some of these predictions turn out to be. Um, I also want to say what a special delight it is um, to see this room uh, and this event. I, we, it, when on Wola's 20th anniversary in 1994, we had the idea of maybe we should do like organize a dinner that we might be able to raise money with. Um, and we were so good at it. I remember that we organized it. We spent. We, we organized it. Uh, during the Summit of the Americas, when everybody uh, who mattered on the policy side was away. Uh, and I, I, my recollection is we spent $5,000 and lost $5,000. And we never tried it again while I was director. So uh, there's a good reason why Joy is the director today. And uh, I'm far more tenacious. Um, <laughs> Uh, it, it's actually a great honor and a privilege to be here because of the reason I'm here tonight. Um, and I, 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 I want to say, I think for many, if not most, of the people in this room, um, it, it's almost unnecessary to, to say why Helen Mack is being honored with the Wola Human Rights Award. Uh, there's a storyline, I think, that most are familiar with even with its many tragic elements, which started with the murder of her sister, a social anthropologist uh, who studied what displaced people displaced by the armed conflict in Guatemala when she left her office in Guatemala City on September 11th, 1990. Uh, and it was, of course, as all such crimes were treated by the authorities as a as some kind of common crime. And it was Helen's conviction that it was a political crime and her determination to see that the perpetrators of that crime were brought to justice that I think most of us know about. Uh, more than 12 judges later, uh, more than a dozen years later, um, for the first time in Guatemala, there was actually a conviction of a military officer and the indictment and ultimately conviction of a general and uh, two subordinates for being the intellectual authors of that act. Uh, 
it's been a long and difficult struggle. My colleague Rob Vernick was telling me the story of uh, when the, the first uh, guilty verdict was issued uh, in 2002 or 2003 of coming out of the, the, the uh, Supreme Court building where the final judgment was issued into a torrential downpour where more than a thousand people were standing chanting, Helen, Helen, Helen. I think that story we know. And that story has, is being honored tonight and has rightly been honored in many other fora. Uh, I want to talk briefly, though, uh, within my three minutes, I hope, about another storyline that has been going on at the same time uh, uh, that has equally demonstrated uh, Helen's courage, her understanding of what needs to happen uh, in the transition from authoritarian military dictatorships to build viable civilian democracies in Guatemala and in Central America, which started, uh, I, I'm not sure why it started. I, I mean, one of the things that I think had an effect on Helen was that as part of that process of seeking justice for her, those, for her, her sister, uh, she convinced a police investigator who was involved with uh, finding out who was responsible to actually provide public testimony. And that brave police investigator was assassinated. And it was Helen, ever since that moment at least, as far as I know, has also recognized that the other half of the job is to build effective state institutions capable of protecting both the security and the rights of citizens. She was the head of the commission that was set up following the signing of the peace accords, the commission to strengthen the justice system in, uh, in Guatemala, which brought together civil society activists and government people to try to design a new justice system. We're still working on it. She came, I remember working, her, she was working with Jeff Fail and Adriana Beltran in 2001 or 2002 to explore the idea of whether or not something like the Grupo Conjunto, which the United Nations had established in El Salvador as part of its follow-up to the peace accords there, might be a way of building a combined international and domestic justice system that could function in circumstances where you had uh, the, 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 the same perpetrators of violence and organized crime elements and death squads that had morphed into organized crime rings as part, still part of the state apparatus of how do, you, how do you actually investigate and bring people to justice for common and organized crime. Uh, and that's what's today known as the International Commission, uh, actually, CICIG is what we all call it. Uh, it was called first CICIACS and then CICIG. And the first version was kind of weak. And Helen again participated from 2004 to 2006 with the vice president and other officials of the state and again leading a civil society coalition in Guatemala to get a much stronger version lobbied for and ultimately approved and still working today, which has indicted at least one past president, convicted at least one past president uh, of Guatemala for, uh, for his, his involvement in organized crime. It's an ongoing struggle. It's a long struggle. It requires courage. It requires dedication, uh, and that's uh, uh, one of the one of the the reasons we're here tonight is to to to, to honor Helen for understanding the balance between and the need to deal with both the monitoring and and denouncing of abuses that Carlos described, but also the 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 task 
of helping to build effective state institutions that can protect citizen security and protect the rights of citizens. So with that, I thank you. I think George said all my speech, so. <laughs> but uh, thank you very much, and good night to everybody. I am, I am moved, deeply moved, to be one of the recipients of the 2012 Wola Human Rights Awards. And it is with a profound sense of humility that I accept the honor that you have chosen to bestow upon me, because I know your choice transcends my person. When my sister was a victim of an arbitrary execution on September 11th of 1990, I embarked on a journey to bring the perpetrators to justice. This was the first case of human rights violations before the courts, the first conviction of a perpetrator, and the first case where the intellectual authors were on trial and one was declared guilty of planning and ordering the crime. But beyond that, the quest of determining the facts of the murder, the logic that motivated is and the system that allowed it to happen. Allow me and the Miramar Foundation to have a say on many issues of national debate and several legal initiatives and institutional reforms. From the attention given to the refugees and the internal displaced persons, through my sister's research to the discussion taking place in the context of the peace agreements on reforms to the army and intelligence apparatus, the elimination of an absolute state secrets privilege for the military and the law on access to public information. Thus, the obstacles faced while attempting to achieve justice for Mirna's murder illustrated us on the need to reform the administration of justice, the national police, and the penitentiary system to promote the rule of law in Guatemala. If we were facing these obstacles, we did not want others to go through the same ordeal. In the end, the Mac case, as our journey is usually referred to, exposed the abuses that systematically occurred during the war in Guatemala. It revealed the mechanisms, structures, and actors in Guatemala that were used to persecute and eliminate ideological opponents. It is also exposed the networks created to ensure impunity. While the <clears throat> counterinsurgency doctrine and actions may no longer serve the purpose of combating perceived internal enemies, other groups, such as the drug trafficking and organized crime, continue to use violence as a means to achieve their goals and permeate the judiciary system to ensure impunity for their crimes. Therefore, our struggle our quest for strengthening the institutions and our determination to promote a real democracy in Guatemala is unneeded now as it was when my sister was murdered 22 years ago. In 2010 and 2011, I lead an initiative to reform the Guatemalan National Police. This is a long-standing issue that has always been among the concerns and priorities of activists in Guatemala. Although, the political dynamic of this proposal are prompted by circumstances greater distance from Mirna's murder. For me, at its true core and heart, the motivations are one and the same. A highly professional, honest, and brave police investigator, Jose Miguel Merida Escobar, was killed after issuing a report stating that my sister had been murdered by the military. He was the first state officer willing to bring justice to my sister to put end to impunity and pay with his life in the line of duty. 
Throughout my efforts to bring change to my country, WOLA has always been a tremendous support, particularly by shaping policies, both in the United States and in Guatemala, on issues such as human rights, democracy, and social justice. WOLA envisions a future where human rights and social justice are the foundation for public policy in Latin America and the Caribbean and in the U.S. relationship with the region, where change happens when people on the ground connect with people who make policy, and where people work together across borders to respect human rights and democratic values. On this occasion, I want to thank WOLA, not only for this honor, but most of all, for its contribution to recognize the tight connection between human rights, institutional reform, and rule of law in Guatemala. And before leaving, I don't want to leave if I don't recognize some people who had the patience through all this year and have been walking with me, such as Bonnie Tenerello, Rachel Garst, Susan Peacock, Adriana Beltran, and executive director such as uh, George Vickers and Joy Olson. But one of the persons I, I really have in my mind and I have it here in front of me is to thank also Joe Elrich as founder of WOLA, who has really been a stand Because in this room, I can see many faces who has been walking with me in these 22 years. People who helped me to open my eyes, to open my horizons of what we should do, to be rooted in what civil society can stand for. When I started working for the police reform, there was a big debate, and we decided that, or at least I decided that it was time to leave aside my suit of my first Holy Communion and work with the mud and the scum that is the National Police. And those words, I have it in my head when Janice O'Connell, when we were in Congress and we were talking about the hidden powers and all of these clandestine groups, she said, you're going to be working with the scum of our society. And that was true. But you know what? behind corruption, police corruption, behind many of these structures, you also can understand that behind of them, it's also human beings. And human rights is that, that we can work, doesn't matter who they are, but the public policies should be centered in human beings. So thank you. Thank you very much, Helen, um, for those amazing words. Um, really, it, it, it was um, Helen has captured so much about uh, what is uh, wonderful about WOLA, uh, what is wonderful about uh, um, uh, the perseverance of human rights uh, um, defenders, and um, it has left me pretty much speechless, and um, so that's a good thing, because it means the night is almost over. And soon, I will be introducing all of you um, to dessert, coffee, drinks, and music. Um, but before I do, uh, I'd like to just make one or two short announcements. First of all, I'd like to um, uh, pay a special thanks to our sponsors. You will find them all listed in your booklet, which you can find on your table. Thank you very much to the sponsors. Uh, 
I, I would also uh, like to draw your attention to one other thing that's on your table. It's a nifty little tent card that you might have thought was decorative because it has the great Wola uh, uh, logo on it. But it's not just there for decoration. Um, <laughs> if you open up the tent card, you'll see something on the inside that, uh, that allows you to consider whether or not you would like to make a contribution to, uh, to Wola. Many of you uh, have already made a contribution to WOLA. All of you have made a contribution to WOLA by being here tonight. Uh, many of you have paid to be here tonight. And now here's protocol guy asking you to give again. Um, and uh, you know, this is a soft sell. It's a card. If you feel like filling it out, great. We are super grateful. If you don't, uh, that's OK, too. Um, but for my part, I'm going to fill it out. Um, because uh, WOLA has become, over the last few years, my number one uh, giving priority. It's, it's really important to me. And um, there's no uh, better way to say why than just to reflect on what was said this evening um, by all of our presenters and all of our honorees. So uh, I invite you all to consider um, uh, wh where Wool is on your giving priorities. And um, in the meantime, I, cons I would like you all to consider joining um, all of our honorees and our staff and our board and, our, uh, and, and everybody else uh, who cares to stay for some dessert um, just outside. Thank you so much for coming. This was a terrific event. Thank you to the staff. And good night. <laughs>